Hello and welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for Soccer Doodle Doo and with me today is Kid Band himself, my good friend S.C. McBeater. Say hi! Come on, ring the bell, come on, ring the bell, I want to lay my hands on it. Just to get underway, so as mentioned, this is Soccer Doodle Doo, released on the 10th of May, 1952. It's the 649th in the series, and it's directed by Bob McKimson. I mean, there is a HD restoration floating out there. There's no physical release of this short yet, but hopefully they'll come up on some sort of collector's choice set or whatever. So there's a good chance it probably will. It's a pretty safe cartoon anyway to put on one okay. of those sets. <laughs> Anybody, I say, anybody get the number of that truck? Now, in case you haven't seen this one, I can't show you the full thing here due to copyright on YouTube, but what happens is a crate containing the boxing rooster Kid Banty falls out of a truck and ends up being, well, in the middle of the usual shenanigans between Foghorn and the Barnyard Dog. So, Kid Banty is like the third character that's become the formula, if you will, for these type of shorts, which we'll get into very shortly, as you're going to mention this, see, on this review. <laughs> What's a big idea swatting me on a schnozzola when I'm sleeping? But mm -hmm. I'll just quickly go through some of the trivia here. So the Kid Banty character is voiced by Sheldon Leonard, who had voiced the cat in Kid and the Kitten. I suspect, I don't have any confirmation here, but I would imagine McKimson probably had Sheldon do the two cartoons at once, so to speak. Maybe not the same recording session, but maybe the same series of sessions. McKinson, and... he sort of followed the Clampett Avery route of not using as many regulars as usual because Clampett brought in Stan Freeberg and Avery brought in Kent Rogers because, again, like I said, those guys were sort of the folks that would bring in new guys to do stuff and they would become regulars, but sorry, then just keep on relying on the same people. Exactly. And I actually discussed Sheldon Leonard with uh, Camden Spees in the, the actual review for Kid and the Kitten, but I'll briefly mention he, he basically played a lot of the, I suppose, the heavies, the New Yorker type bad guys, and he had that really thick accent, and he was in, in It's a Wonderful Life and those sort of yeah, films. a bit of a wise guy for the deep city, yeah. Yeah, like he would talk like that. And and again, given that he didn't have, doesn't have too many lines in this short, I would guess that maybe it was just a case of, yeah, just record these few lines and see you later. That's my guess anyway. I do like the reference to the fact that Kid Banty is a pin featherweight champ. So we got two references <laughs> there. One of them is that, of course, that in boxing there are weight divisions and one of them is the featherweight. And the weight limit is 57 kilos or 126 pounds. Take your pick, non-metric people. <laughs> but uh, pin feathers is also a term for feathers that are on birds that haven't matured yet. That is the feathers they eventually lose as they get older. And banty roosters are those small, aggressive roosters that are more suitable for like those for the, the, the despicable, quote-unquote, sport known as cockfighting. And yeah, it's, it's terrible. I don't want to mention any further, but that's basically the types of roosters that... Yeah, I, I, I hate getting the cockfights. Yes, it's just ridiculous. And later on, we see that whole thing with the Barnyard Dog going crazy over a supposed uh, hula hula hut. And we see two photos of uh, these uh, you know, hula girls at the front. Now, I could go on and on and on about this topic, about uh, cultural appropriation involving the settlers in Hawaii and just that whole messy, complicated history involving the hula but to put it simply, by this point, Hawaii was not a state yet, I believe 1959, and you think you mentioned that to me, because I'm not mm -hmm. American, of course. <laughs> but I believe this point, happened a few months after Alaska. Yes. And at this point, the hula girls were seen as ironic desires for men on the mainland, like objects of desire, the, the exotic nature of these beautiful women from not around here kind of things. It was definitely a thing, but again, I'm not going to get into the complicated mm -hmm. history involving the hula and... That kind of stuff, but uh, yeah, that's what it's basically referencing to. Soccer Doodle Doo. I watched this one. I don't even recall seeing this one before. I think this is the first time I've seen it. And I gotta say, for a Foghorn short, this one's pretty good. I mean, it's not the best, mm -hmm. but it was funny. I liked it. What did you think of it? I thought it was pretty good. Definitely settles into what becomes expected of the Foghorns. But uh, one of the things I did pick up on it when watching is that most notably is that there's a bit more structure going on. Again, it seems like they're trying to get away from just doing Henry Hawk. 
and that sort of thing and trying to really introduce things. Again, there's the one with the Sylvester cat and the green worm that was again a little try at this. And this one sort of brings it all together of just how to structure it. Again, I think Ted Pierce was really good with structure and adding pieces where gags could be put in again. That's what McKimson did. He would just put in these good gags and again, it's set up pretty well and it has great execution as I would say. Yeah, exactly. And we're pretty much going to be settled into this formula where you have Falkhorn and the Barney dog. They have their little <laughs> shenanigans trying to one-up each other. And in this case, the dog actually starts things off. Sometimes Falkhorn <laughs> will start things off. Sometimes the dog will. But then you got the third character to throw a spanner in the works involving the whole rivalry between those two <laughs> characters. And it works. There's nothing wrong with it. But that's what <laughs> they'll, of course, focus on. And here... We, we have Kid Banty, which I think is a great idea. I really do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we get that great setup. You mentioned about structure. Ted Pierce does really well here in setting up the whole premise where, okay, mm -hmm. Banty falls off the truck and the, and the crate and you get the beautiful boxing animation when he gets up, realizing that, no, he wasn't actually knocked out by a, you know, another boxer. He sees the cow and the cow bell rings and he punches him out. And straight away, just for that little bit of action, for that minor scene, it sets mm -hmm. the whole premise up. You know full well, bang. That's going to be your whole short right there, that somehow bells are going to be involved and mm -hmm. it's going to involve this boxer going crazy. Similar to how Curly goes crazy at Pop Goes the Weasel in one of the first uh, mm -hmm. Three Stooges shorts, you know, that kind of thing. It's a similar mm -hmm. concept, really. In fact, that's what this reminded me of, to be completely honest. But one thing I do want to pose a question to the people watching, because I couldn't find out if this is referencing anything. When the cow says... For buttermilk. Is anyone up for buttermilk? I was having a look because that sounds to me like it's it must be some sort of an ad campaign. Reminds me of say like anyone for tennis, but I think they do again and know like anyone for something later on with Foghorn. My memory's a little bit lingy. But again, they do it quite well. It's a really weird line, but it works in that weird way where she doesn't really want to get hurt anymore or something. Yeah, so I'm wondering if that whole buttermilk thing is just referring to an ad campaign or if it's just a random throwaway line or something, just referring to something else. So if you know, definitely let me know in the comments. And we do get a gag that I think works better in a later short, but at least this is, I suppose, the genesis of this idea mm -hmm. with the whole one or two lumps that the dog does. And of course, uh, Falcon goes two lumps and yeah, the dog hits him. And yeah, we, mm -hmm. we see that later on in the Pete Puma short uh, which i can't wait to get to because i love that one it's a fantastic short one of the best by mckimson in my opinion but who doesn't love that flying saucer gag it's such a ridiculous elaborate setup just for a saucer to go down the pipe oh, oh i thought that was hilarious what i thought it was really funny too again again there's a whole big setup with it and again i guess there was a bit of real concern with the outer world in the post-war era yeah and again using it in the countryside environment makes total sense as to it being there I'm thinking War of the Worlds by Orson Welles from much earlier. That may have not been forgotten. But again, this is the pop culture that was in the mind. And again, McKinson sets it up with the joke that he's going to reuse very well in Rabbit's Kin. That was also in Wise Quacking Duck. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, just love the genuine flying saucer. And he gets what was promised, though. He gets the flying mm -hmm. saucer just right to his head. So I thought that was a great gag there. And one or two lumps, sir. Uh... Two, please. Of course, being a Falkhorn short, I love me some Falkhorn <laughs> sayings here. And mm -hmm. we get two that I really, really love. We get the whole, you're doing a lot of chopping and no chips are flying. Stop, I say stop it, boy. You're doing a lot of chopping, but no chips are flying. And the whole, his muscles are as soggy as a used tea bag. His muscles are as soggy as a used tea bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just cracks me up. I, I love Falcon as a character. Even in the latest shorts when the animation's cheaper and it's maybe not as funny, mm -hmm. but the, the Falcon sayings still get me, so at least I can watch it for that reason. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Now, I've got to ask you, like, why do you think Falcon loves playing those childhood games? Because I know in the previous short he does the Cat's Cradle string game, but here he's playing hopscotch, he's cutting silhouettes. At, at, like... I can't tell exactly what he's kind of... I can't tell if he's trying to grab the barnyard dog by the neck or if they're just having fun. Maybe they're trying to evict a sense of ruralism by doing that, because again, there's no like big pool halls in the small towns, there's not many games to play. Because again, he does have a bit of a sport feeling to him, because again, he's just playing baseball in later ones, stuff like that. 
I just think it was done to reflect ruralism. I mean, it's just like that nice little added touch gives them a bit of extra character. They just like playing these games to pass the time, I suppose. And later on, we even see him using a stethoscope to find worms and apples. So I guess mm -hmm. you know, maybe he's trying to make a game out of it. I don't know, but I thought it was good. But one of the cleverest things in this short, though, is, yeah, they set up the whole premise with the bell, which makes Kid Panty mm -hmm. crazy. And, okay, we start off with Falkhorn doing the bell like normal, yeah? But then the dog does something mm -hmm. genuinely clever where it's like oh it's a booby trap and it ends up being mm -hmm. a clock and we hear a little bell come out of that little clock and i thought that was pretty clever i, I didn't see that coming mm -hmm. i thought that was pretty good i was uh, i see I, I was right it was a booby trap I definitely agree that there's a lot of really clever things because, again, we get a bit of foreshadowing when, when Foghorn's trying to fix a clock earlier. Exactly. And then, of course, we end with that hula scene on the animation of the dog just going crazy over the supposed girls inside. I thought that was pretty mm -hmm. hilarious. And then we end with pretty much a sparring partner that's at the right size for Kid Banty, which uh, mm -hmm. is also another thread that goes throughout this whole short about, oh, we've got to find you sparring partner. And we even get... Foghorn dressed up as an actual boxing trainer, like he goes all the way. I uh, thought that was a nice touch where he doesn't have to dress up, but he does, like an old timey bo boxing trainer. And then, yeah, they end with the fact that Kid Banty can now battle someone his size. And speaking of battles, just to slowly wrap this up, animation of each rival, of each person getting knocked out, that's probably the best bits of animation in the short. Mm -hmm. I mean, what did you think? Yeah, I definitely thought there's a lot of great animation. Again, I think the opening's very well done, setting up everything. It's very well animated, very nice art. But we just got off of recording Little Red Rodent. We were just talking about that. I was talking about how strong the color palette is. I don't really see that in too many of McKimson shorts. He wasn't really much of a designer as more of an animator. That's something that came to mind. He definitely was great with character, but I don't know if color or general design work was his best. And here, the cartoon looks great. It really does. Just... It's simple, it's effective, I think it looks nice. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms of a score, this is a nice, solid Falkhorn. Maybe laugh. I give it 8 out of 10. It's not the best Falkhorn, but I laughed. I thought this was a great third character that they put in here to mess with the dynamic between the two rivals. That will be rivals till the end of time, I think. But, uh, yeah, I think 8 out of 10. I would give it an 8 too. Pretty good stuff. Yeah, exactly. And again, this is the first time I watched it, and hopefully this restoration will make its way to physical media at some point. I think it will, but it's just a matter of when. That'll do it for this one. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, take care. That's all, folks. I've heard he shows never been to him, no. <laughs> now watch, I say, what's the big old...